get deep into our hearts and our souls and make a difference, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, how many of you know there, there are three voices that speak to us on a regular basis? We have our human spirit, which speaks to us all the time, our conscience, our human spirit. Unfortunately, there are enemy spirits that would like to lie and deceive to us. And then there's the Holy Spirit. It's very hard sometimes to discern who exactly is speaking to you. And so I remember a number of years ago when I was first a Christian, I have got to tell you this. When I was first a Christian, all these women were talking about what the Lord told me to do this and the Lord told me to do that. And I'm thinking, he hasn't told me anything. You're actually hearing from him like, you know, coffee, Jesus, and tea. I just, I couldn't have the concept that God speaks to us. And uh, so they just went on and on with their walk with God, and he tells them this and he tells them that. So we go to hear a big speaker in a conference in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and this was the day of cassettes. Can I get a witness? About that big, a ca never mind. At least it wasn't a VHS track or something. So she's got on her table, ministry table, how to hear the voice of God. So I made the $3 investment, and I bought the CD, uh, it wasn't a CD, I bought the cassette. And I went home and I played it. And God bless her, she had the gift of gab. She talked about 90 minutes um, and made the statement I just made to you in three seconds. Three voices, human, Holy Spirit, enemy spirit. But then she was telling, I, so I thought, you know what, let me listen to this again. Because I really want to know how to hear from God. So I put another 90 minutes in. I'm three hours invested now. And this is what she said for me to do. She said, you go up and get in your prayer room. You bind the enemy. You silence yourself, and then you lift your hands, and you say, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. So I was about as sincere as you can get, and I knelt by my bed, and I told the devil where to go and exactly how to get there in no uncertain terms. Remember, I'm a new Christian, and uh, then I told myself for the first time in my life, would you please shut up? And then I lifted my hands and I said, oh, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. And I'm telling you, not audible, but in here, so strong, I heard Romans 18.8. So I started to cry because I had my first word from God that he spoke to me. So I ran down the steps and I got into the kitchen. And I got my Bible and I just could not wait to read Romans 18.8 because it was going to be life changing. Well, there's only 16 chapters in the book of Romans. <laughs> there's no such book. As Romans 18.8. So I just stood there sobbing. I thought, I don't even know how to hear from you. And I really, I heard it. It was profound, but it was wrong. And you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. So I think that was my human spirit. Or it might have been the enemy wanting me to throw in the towel and give up. But I didn't do it. And I've learned over the years how to hear the voice of God. So I want to start in the book of 1 Samuel with a very uh, simple story. I'll, I'll tell you this young man's story. Then we'll look at three things uh, important about Samuel. Uh, first of all, there was a man named Elkanah, and he was married to a woman named Hannah. This is all in 1 Samuel 1. And uh, Elkanah, the name Elkanah means one whom God possesses. And that's been my prayer for my son and my grandsons, that God will possess these men. And he falls in love with a woman named Hannah, and the name Hannah means God has given me grace. Well, they're married, they're happy in chapter 1, but the problem is she is infertile and she cannot have children. And so several years go by, and she's childless. So her husband decides to take a second wife. Why any man would want two mothers-in-law is beyond my comprehension. <laughs> Men, can I get an amen? Don't you dare. So, so... He goes and he marries another woman named Panina. Well, Panina, I call Panina Fertile Myrtle because she has a baby every nine months. If you read chapter one, it said she had many sons and many daughters, and they would all have to go to church together three times a year in a place called Shiloh. And so Hannah would have to see Panina, the other wife, and all of her children fathered by her husband. Are you following the story? This cannot be a happy event going to church, knowing that you're infertile, you feel like something's wrong with you, this other woman is probably pregnant every time you're on the road to Shiloh. And so after many sons and many daughters and many years, Hannah had had it. She went into the church and she began to cry and pray. And we all know her prayer. You hear about her every Mother's Day. But she said, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him to you for the rest of his life. And it said that God remembered Hannah's prayer, and she conceived. And she gave birth to a little boy and named him Samuel. And the name Samuel means God heard my affliction. 
So now she has this little toddler, toddler Samuel, and um, it's time to go back to Shiloh. And she says to her husband, I'm not going to go until he's weaned off my breast. I want to take the next probably, I think, maybe three years. I'm not sure exactly how long women choose to breastfeed. But in the Bible days, it was around two to three years. You couldn't go to Walmart and buy a jar of baby food. Or you couldn't call Amazon and get pablum. So they breastfed their babies. And she said, as soon as he's weaned off the breast, I will go to Shiloh to church with you. So she takes Samuel. Bible scholars believe he was about three years old, three to four years old. She brings him into the church. And she literally gives him to God. She leaves him in the temple with a priest named Eli to be raised in the service and the house of God. Now, as a mother, I cannot imagine her pain on the road home. She still sees Panina. She still sees her half or her husband's children. And she has no child with her. And her dedication to God was amazing that she would give him to the Lord. And so she left him there. And the Bible said every year she'd go and take him clothes. She would make him outfits and things like that. But what I want to talk about is three things about Samuel. We always hear about Hannah. We hear about Penina. We hear about Elkanah. But we don't hear much about Samuel till later when he becomes a wonderful prophet. But things happen in his childhood that are very important to us. And so the first point I want to make is in chapter 1, she's leaving him in the temple. And I'm going to read 27 and then 28 will be on the board for you. She said, for this child I prayed... And the Lord has given me my petition that I've asked of him. Therefore, I have lent or given him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he will be lent or given to the Lord. Now, don't miss this first phrase about Samuel. And he worshipped the Lord. So the very first thing about this little baby or this little toddler is he was a worshiper. And how many of us know you can never start kids too soon in the nursery singing, Father Abraham had many sons and... Yvette used to play music uh, in her, on her stomach when she was pregnant with Jake, who is now a drummer and plays the guitar and loves music. You can never start them too young to hear praise and worship music because they have a little spirit, these kids. They might not be able to communicate yet, but they have a spirit. They're created in the image of God. He's a worshiper. So I'm not sure how he worshiped or what songs he sang, but the first important point on him is he was a worshiper. Now, in chapter 2, on her way home, Hannah gets a word from God that she'll have more sons and more daughters. That must have been so comforting, and she did. I think she had like five more children. Um, And so in chapter 2, on their way home, I want to show you the second thing in verse 11. It says, And Elkanah went to his house, but the child, Samuel, did minister to the Lord before Eli the priest. So he went from being a worshiper to a minister, and the same word for that is a servant. So maybe, you know, if kids in in, uh, children's church, maybe they'll get the juice boxes or they'll put the felt board up in my day. Who remembers felt board? Anybody? Nobody? Thank you. And so I'm not exactly sure what his ministry was, but he went from a worshiper to a minister or a servant of God. Then you get to chapter 2, and one of the most wonderful scriptures about Samuel In chapter 2, verse 26, it says this. These are the three things about Samuel. And the child grew and had favor both with the Lord and also with men. I can't think of any three things I would want more for my children, grandchildren or great-grandchildren, than to worship God at a young age, to want to serve him with their life, and then to know they have favor with God and man. So look at his background. He's been nowhere but in God's presence, in the temple, in the sanctuary, with the priest, his entire life. And in chapter 3, God is going to speak to him. And what happens is he misses the voice of God. And I remember having a real wake-up call reading his story, and I thought, you mean I can sing in the choir and be a worshiper and not hear God's voice? The answer is yes. Do you mean I can serve in the nursery and help in the church and miss God's voice? The answer is yes. Can I have favor with God and man and miss God's voice? Yes, I can. And so this has been uh, very impactful in my life because I don't want to spend my life worshiping and serving and having favor and miss God's voice for my personal life. You do know this morning there are hundreds if not thousands of people in churches who aren't even saved. They don't know the voice of God. They go to worship every Sunday, and a lot of them serve in the church, 
but they've never had a real encounter with Jesus as their personal Savior. I did it for 25 years until I became saved or accepted Christ as my Savior. So we don't want to miss the voice of God. So in chapter 3, God speaks to him. And what he does, which makes perfect sense, he's going to run to his mentor, Eli the priest. So I'm just going to read 1 Samuel 3, verses 4 through 7. Verse 4. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, I am here. And he ran to Eli. He said, here I am, for you called me. He said, I did not call you. Go lay down. And he went and lay down. So that's the first time God speaks. He runs to his mentor, his priest, Eli. Verse 6. And the Lord called yet again. I underlined that in my Bible because I'm so glad that when I miss the voice of God, there's a yet again and a yet again and a yet again. He doesn't stop speaking to us if our hearts are turned towards him. So then in verse 5, um, I read that already. Eli told him, go and lay down. Verse 6, and the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli. And he said, here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call you, my son. Lay down. Now, verse 7 was, uh, was a riveting verse to me that was a shocker of shockers. Because in verse 7, it said, Samuel, verse 7, did not know the Lord. Now, I'm not here to preach an evangelistic message because you're believers. But do you understand that you can worship? and serve, and have favor, and not have a personal encounter with the Lord. Because it said Samuel did not yet know the Lord, for the word of the Lord was not revealed to him. And so I believe in verse 7 that this is when Samuel had a personal connection with God. Every child at a certain age comes to the realization. And I think that this was his conversion, so to speak, because it said he did not know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord revealed to him. So he missed God's voice three, a couple of times. Because he didn't have a personal relationship. I believe from this moment on he did. And so I want to tell you, I only have three ways that I want to share with you this morning how to hear the voice of God. Number one, it's found in 1 Samuel 3, verse 21. It said, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, and the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The number one way you and I hear God is by the word of the Lord. And the Bible is God's word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word is God. The word Jesus became flesh, dwelt among us. If you don't read your Bible, and I'm not saying that to make you feel bad, but if you don't spend any time in scripture, you're going to have a very hard time hearing from God because your own human spirit can deceive you. You can have a thought and think it's God. Where did Romans 18, 8 come from? Nowhere in my book. And yet I believed as I cried that I heard from God till I got my Bible and realized, whoops, <laughs> that was my human spirit. So spend as much time as you possibly can in the word of God. And if you have a version you don't understand or a version you don't really like, get something easy to read. Get the passion. Get the living Bible. Angels are not in heaven going, oh, Pastor Gwen uses King James. Check. Star. Check. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. What matters is that you understand it and that you can live it. I'm sorry that I, sometimes I really wish I could get away from King James, but I've been saved 50 years now and I'm a little bit stubborn and I'm a little bit stuck. But in my personal reading, I use the NIV. It's easier to understand. Not that it, not that the passion or the message Bible aren't good. What's the point of reading something if you don't get anything out of it? And you know, the enemy works really hard to get us to forget the word of God. No offense to the men. I'll use my husband as an example. Men can remember f football, baseball, stats, who won the World Series. What is that? Football, baseball, tr track. What is the World Series? Uh, well, they can remember. And they can tell you team. If they can tell you what team played what other team five years ago. And yet, when it comes to scripture... They can read something. No offense to the men. I don't know what women retain. Maybe Red Book Magazine or something. I don't know. But I know that my husband was skilled. Him, him and Matt would sit down. And the next thing you know, they're going back 10 years. Talking about all these championships and who got the trophy Heisman thing. All this. And, and, um, and yet, when it comes to scripture... The enemy wants to take it out of your heart and out of your mind, and he doesn't want you to remember it. If you can remember baseball, football, and stats, men, you can remember the word of God. Just bind the enemy before you read the word and ask God to give you a sharp, 
crisp memory of God's word. Put it in your heart. Meditate it. And I don't know what women. I'll have to find out how to pick on the women if I ever do this message again. Because I'm not sure what they'd remember. Maybe recipes. Right, Lena? Wherever Lena is, uh, I know that this girl can probably tell you 12 or 15 recipes and scripture. Let me do justice to my friend. So here's the point. Only the written word is the first way to hear from God. And so I want to tell you a personal testimony uh, that actually happened that is just phenomenal. A number of years ago, uh, who knows now, maybe 25 years ago, I was invited to speak in Syracuse, New York. And so I went to my husband. I never took a speaking engagement without my husband's blessing me to go and covering me in prayer. And many times he would go with me. And so I said to him, honey, I've been invited to Syracuse, New York. And he said to me, do they have any idea where you live? Because it should be at least a seven-hour drive to Syracuse from Atlantic City. Depends who's driving. <clears throat> but it should be at least seven to seven and a half hours. And um, he goes, that's a, a long way to go for one speaking engagement. It's different if I had a three-day retreat and I'm going to speak Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He said, they really want you to drive all the way to Syracuse for one 45-minute speaking engagement, stay overnight, it's too far to drive home, and drive back seven and a half hours. He goes, you understand you're going to be away from our family, our children, for two full days for a 45-minute message. And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, do you really believe God wants you to go? And I said, I absolutely do. He said, then you have my blessing. So I get in the car with a girlfriend and we drive all the way to Syracuse, New York. I preach at a dinner meeting. We stay overnight. We drive all the way home. I'm probably getting home three or four in the afternoon. And two weeks later, I get a phone call and they said, we want you to come back to Syracuse. And I said, do you have a map? Do you know where I live? Do you understand that New York's a big state? And you have a lot of speakers in New York. You don't really need to bring me in all the way from New Jersey to Syracuse. Well, we prayed. And God said, you're our speaker again this month. And I said, well, you better pray for my husband because I'm not so sure he's going to hear what you're hearing. So being a woman, I made his favorite dinner. Pork chops, applesauce, mashed taters. Um, and I buttered him up with a big meal. And after dinner, I said, oh, honey, you won't believe who called me today. And he said, who? And I said, Syracuse. And he looked at me, he's not Syracuse, New York. I'm like, yeah, Syracuse, New York. They want me to come back again. He said, Gwen, now I had to listen to the, to the man logic. Wear and tear on the tires. I'm going to need an oil change. It's going to hurt my fan belt or my serpentine belt or something. So he's giving me, me this entire lecture of the wear and tear on the car. And then he said, but if God wants you to go, I'll release you, but don't ask again. And I thought that was very reasonable. So... Three weeks later, four weeks from the first event, back to Syracuse, back home, gone for two days. As God is my witness, two weeks later, they call me again. And I said, you people have lost your mind. If you think I'm coming back to Syracuse and traveling 14 hours, come on, 14 hours um, for a message. I said, my husband is not going to allow me to come. I know he's not. So then they laid this on me. We fasted and prayed. They didn't just pray, they fasted and prayed. So now that I know they fasted, I can't ignore them. They said, will you pray about coming? And I should have said no. I just should have said no. But I said, yes, I'll pray. So that night, Boo had another favorite meal plus dessert. How many of you know? Apple pie, vanilla ice cream, warmed in the microwave with a little cinnamon. So after dinner and dessert, I said, honey, you won't believe who called. He said, it better not be Syracuse. I said, yeah, it was Syracuse. He goes, Gwen, listen, let's get a reality check here. This is ridiculous. And he said, you're just not going to go. It's too far, and you're away from our children for two full days and away from me. They have enough speakers in New York State. They don't need you. And I said to him, but honey, they fasted. He said, well, I had my meal, and I'm happy. <laughs> so, so I said, but I told them we would pray. He said, all right, we'll pray. So we took hands, and we prayed together, and I let my husband pray. And this is what he prayed that night. God, if it's your will for my wife to go to Syracuse this third time, you have to tell me. Otherwise, I'm not going to release her to go. We both said amen. We get up in the morning, we have our coffee, and we're going to do our Bible devo devotion. We don't skip around. We had a steady devotion we did in the morning. And we ha happened to be in the book of Acts chapter uh, 28. So I want to show you the verse that we read when we started our morning devotions. Can you put up? 
It says, and landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. Really? Real? Well, I, I took a fit. I mean, I danced around the kitchen. I, I was whooping and hollering. And my husband's sitting there going, I can't believe that that's in the Bible. Because it's your third trip. It, now, you understand we're stretching this, but that is the word Syracuse. And that's where I was going for the third time. I went and never got invited back. That day did something to me to realize that everything we need is in the word of God. Now, this is an extreme testimony. You understand I've been saved for years and not ever had something this dramatic. But that did it for me. I thought if God can tell me his will for me to go to Syracuse on the third trip... He can guide me for my children. He can help me in my marriage. He can help me to follow him and serve him. But I have to spend time in the word of God. Number one, it must be the written word. Okay, so that's your first thing, the written word. The second word, the way you hear from God, is the whisper, the spoken word. So I'm going to read John 10, a very familiar scripture, and then just one from the Old Testament. God never spoke to my spirit and said, marry thou a plumber. I did. He never spoke in my spirit and said, have a church in Pleasantville, New Jersey. Yet we knew the will of God because we knew the word of God and we understood that not everything you need is written in a scripture. But if you know the scripture first, then you're safe to judge the spoken word or the whisper of God. So in John 10, uh, let me see, I want to get to John 10. I just want to read verses 4 and 5, familiar scripture. And when he had put forth his own sheep, he goes before them. The sheep follow him. You ready? For they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they know not the voice of a stranger. Now look at verse 4 again. He knows his sheep. They follow him, for they know his what? His voice. Not just his written word, but they know his voice. And I remember when my kids were little, I don't know if anybody even knows about this or if it's still open, but we used to go to what we call, what we call Greenhead Lake. It was a, a lake in Port Republic with thousands of greenheads. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a lake the kids could swim in. And after we got chewed and bit to pieces, I said, we're going to the ocean. So I started taking my kids to the ocean. Well, everybody at the day of the ocean, we all have the same name. We're all mommy. There's all these little kids with buckets and sand and playing, and they're mommy this and mommy that, mommy, 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 mommy. And I remember sitting, Matt and Mimi had little buckets and shovels, and they were right there, and I was in my chair, and I was reading a book. And I must have heard the word mom, mommy, or mother 20 times. Never moved me, because it wasn't my child. But the minute Mimi or Matthew said, mom, I looked right up. Why? I know their voice. And see, for me, being um, a speaker, there are people that'll see me in a mall or see me somewhere and know me, and they'll say, Gwen, Gwen. But because I, they're a stranger to me and I don't know their voice, some people have had to call me two or three times, and then, oh, I heard you speak via glow, or I heard you came to our church a couple years ago. So what this is saying to me is relationship. You have to know his voice. And um, the other verse I wanted to read, very important, is 1 Kings 19. Let me tell you how you hear the voice of God. 1 Kings chapter 19, and I want to read verse 11 and 12. I won't give you too much backdrop, but Elijah needed to hear from God. I'm in the wrong book. 1 Kings 19. Sorry. <clears throat> First, Elijah uh, is running for his life. He's afraid of Jezebel. That's a whole other sermon. But um, this is a very wicked woman that threatened to kill him, so he ran for his life in 1 Kings 19. And he's having a dream, or he wakes up, and an angel says, go to Mount Horeb. God wants to speak to you there. So he goes alone to this mountain called Horeb, and in the mountain, God speaks to him. And it's very important that we look at verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. There was a great and strong wind that rent the mountains, broke them in pieces, the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now, don't miss the end of the verse. And after this, there was a still, small whisper. Just a whisper. We all want fire, wind, and earth. Or earth, wind, and fire. Oh, no, that's a music group. We all want 
some angel to write in fire God's will for us or some big windstorm to tell us what to do. And here's the incredible thing about this portion of scripture. These three ways was God's MO. You understand that he spoke through earthquakes when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. You understand that he spoke through a fiery bush when he told and called Abraham. Uh, not Abraham, yeah, Moses. So he spoke through a fiery bush. He spoke on an earthquake. And he spoke to Job in, in the whirlwinds. So God's MO back in this day in the Old Testament was I speak through the winds. I speak through the earthquakes. And I speak through the fire. But here's something God said to me, and I'm going to just move over here. I know you can see, I'd like to just see you for a minute. I'm very careful when I say God told me something, because if it's not God, I would prefer not to be stoned. And I'm not talking about this. So, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm in church. So the point is that when I say to you, God told me this, I'm going to stand on it. And I remember one day reading this, and God spoke to my heart, and I wrote it in every Bible I owned. And this is what he said to me. I probably shouldn't have put it on your worksheet. It's profound. He said, every time you look for the spectacular, you miss the supernatural. I'm going to just say that again. Every time we look for the spectacular, we miss the supernatural. Because God can speak in a whisper. Don't look for winds and fire and hail and rain. Just stay in the word. Listen for the whisper. And so when you hear a whisper, you have to quiet down. So, of course, I have one testimony on this. Um, I went to a woman's conference, and there was a girl named Kathy who had lost a lot of weight. And I became a hater, but I finally forgave her. And uh, so I walk in the conference room, and I hear this in my heart. Just a whisper. Give her $100 for a dress. And I thought, devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You are not taking my money and my prosperity. Get thee behind me. She has a nice dress on. So the next morning I get up, we go to breakfast. I breeze by Kathy and I hear it the second time. I told you to give her $100 for a dress. And so I said to this whisper, well, this is the second dress she has. She doesn't need my money. And uh, so now it's day three. And I've heard this twice, and I've disobeyed because I did not believe it was God. And I don't know about you, I don't carry $100 bills around, and I certainly wouldn't pay $100 for a dress. I'm like, what about J.C. La Penne and Marshalls? I mean, why would anybody spend $100 for a dress unless you're the mother of the bride? So this could not be God. This was the devil trying to rob me of my money. So the third day comes, and I'm staying away from her now. I don't sit with her. I won't eat with her because she's going to cost me big bucks. So I'm avoiding her like she has the plague. Well, the last event, she is sitting next to a woman named Gail. Gail was coming here to speak for us on Mother's Day as my guest speaker, our guest speaker. And I did not have her mailing address. I always like to send the speakers and travel money before they come because gas in that day was $1.95. And uh, so I wanted to get her address to send her a uh, uh, money for gas to come here. So I walk up to Gail. Kathy is sitting right here, and Gail is sitting right here. I don't have a speech impediment. There's nothing wrong with my vocabulary. I looked at Gail. I didn't look at Kathy. And I said, Gail, can I have your address? And Kathy goes, a new dress? I'm getting a new dress? And I buzz, yes, yes. As soon as I get home, I'm going to mail you $100. Yes, God wants me to buy you a new dress. Now, really, really, you have to understand, I'm not making these things up. When you walk with God year after year after year, he does phenomenal things like this. And what touched me so deeply was not the loss of my money, <laughs> although I heard it for a moment, but not really. I took my husband's. Um, so, you know, my dad used to come home from work. Men, let me give you a heads up. My dad would come home from work, and he would dump all his change on the dresser, and he'd go in the shower. Well, every time he took a shower, I hit the jackpot. I'd take quarters, nickels, dimes, and I was doing really well. But anyway, so the point was that it wasn't just that I, it cost me $100. It was profound that she said that. And what brought me to tears was that God was so loving, so gracious, and so kind to give me three chances to get it right and to prove that it was really him. Because we do have to judge the voices we hear. And the third and final way God speaks to us is in Acts 16, and I'm just going to call this the inner witness. I don't know what other title to give this. You and I have a spirit, 
And the Spirit of God is in our spirit. The Bible said, searching out the deeper things. So there are times in your spirit, even though I can't explain this to you, you'll have a nudge, a feeling. You didn't hear a voice. You didn't get a sentence. But you just think, you know what? This is not for me. Or I'm not real comfortable with this. Or I'm not so sure I should attend this. It, does any, does, I need a little feedback here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Have you ever had that nudging in your spirit? Wave your hand. I need to know. All right, good. Because I don't know what to call it. I can't get a, a catchy thing. I just don't know what to call it. So it's the inner witness. So this is the third way God speaks. And we're in Acts chapter 16. And I want to read verses 5 through 8. So were the churches established in the faith, increased in number daily. Now when we had gone throughout Pergia and the region of Galatia, listen to this verse. We were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now that verse is enough to tilt your doctrine because we've been taught to go into all the world and preach the gospel. How could the Holy Ghost forbid Paul and Silas or the men of God to preach the word of God when that was their whole life's mission? Church, the reason was, and I'll just tell you this with the verse, it wasn't time for them to go to Asia. There's a time for everything. In Acts 19, they spent three years in Asia till the continent heard the gospel. This was not the time to go to Asia. And so when you read verse uh, 6, the end of the verse, it's pretty profound. It said, the Holy Ghost forbid us to preach the word in Asia. And the verse, if you want it later, is Acts 19.10, that they were there for three years. But this was not the time to go. Verse 8. And as we passed through Messiah, we came down to Troash. And in a vision there appeared... Wait, did I read the whole thing that I wanted to read? No, I, I missed a little bit of verse 7. Let me slow down. Verse 6, the end of verse 6. We were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7. So we came to Messiah. They, uh, we, we tried to go to Bithynia. And the Spirit suffered us not or would not allow them to go. So passing by Messiah, we came down to Troash. And in, in Tro Troash, they had a vision. Paul was called to Macedonia, so they knew they should go there. But I want you to see that in these two verses, verse 6 and verse 7, it wasn't the devil that stopped them. It was the Holy Spirit that said, I want to restrain you. This is not the time for you to go to this particular place and preach and teach. And so we need to be very sensitive to the Spirit of God. Um, I'm not going to keep you much longer, but a friend of mine... I have to tell you this because it was the first time that the inner witness really spoke to me like this. Uh, one of my dear friends in the, in the day, we heated our houses with um, kerosene, uh, like uh, heaters on the floor. And so she said to her son, Billy, who was 16 years old, Billy, bring the kerosene heater from the kitchen to the living room. And when Billy grabbed the kerosene heater, it spilled and he caught on fire. His arms and his head and so she grabbed the tablecloth, wrapped him, put the fire out, called the police and paramedics, and he was severely burned. And so we get a call like midnight, get on a prayer chain, 16-year-old Billy was burned, and they're airlifting him to Cooper Medical Burn Center. So we knew enough to know that when you're a burn victim, you're going to be hospitalized for a long time. This is not two days and you're released. They have to debrief, you know, they have to do a lot to watch out for infections and so Billy was in the hospital for weeks. People did not think he was going to live. And I was fortunate enough that they allowed me to go in. I wasn't even an ordained minister at the time. But Barbara and her husband really wanted my husband and I to come and pray for Billy. So we went to, I think he was in Cooper at that time. So we went to Cooper Burn Center and we prayed for Billy. We prayed for the family. And a week or two went by and it was Tuesday morning. And I was getting ready to go to my normal Tuesday morning Bible study with my pastor's wife. And as I'm in the shower, I had this, and I didn't know these verses were in the Bible. I had this incredible urge, do not go to Bible study. And I thought, well, that cannot be God. That can't be God. God would want me to study the Bible. So I just started rebuking the enemy. I'm going to Bible study. You can't stop me from going to Bible study. I love God's word. I'm going to Bible study. So I started to get dressed. My kids had gone to school. And I laid down on the bed. And I started to weep and cry and pray for Billy. Now, I didn't know anything. I hadn't talked to Barbara or her husband, Bill. But the Spirit of God was so strong that I could not go to Bible study. And my head was giving me so much trouble because Bible study is a good thing, right? And why would God not want me to go to Bible study? Because he needed people to stop and pray for Billy. So I missed Bible study. First time probably in three years. I never missed Bible study. 
And uh, my kids came home from school. And so the next day or Thursday, I think it was Thursday, Barbara calls me. And she said, I want to tell you what happened to Billy. She said, he almost died. I said, oh, Barbara, what happened? She said, his lungs filled with fluid, and he was drowning. And they told us to call the priest for last rites or get the minister to pray that Billy was not going to survive. And she said, I walked down to the edge of his bed, and I grabbed him by his ankles. She couldn't touch him because of the burns. She said, <coughs> I grabbed him by the ankles, and this is my prayer. Lord, stop the believers right in their tracks. Give them a burden to pray for Billy and let my son live. I said, Barbara, when was that? She said, Tuesday morning. How many of you know I was wrecked? He's alive now. He's a pastor up in Pittsburgh, and he doesn't have a scar on his face, just on his arm, so he wears short sleeve shirts to witness to people what Jesus did healing him. I'm so glad that I obeyed God that day, even though I didn't know for sure it was really the Spirit of God. It was a struggle. But when I got the spirit of intercession to pray for him, I knew I made the right choice. Now, I expect you here next week. Don't come up with, oh, the Holy Ghost told me to stay home. (laughs) Don't try this. The spirit of God suffered me to watch it on TV or online. I'm not buying it. And so these are the ways, I hope this helps you hear God's voice. The scripture, the spirit, and the voice of God. And so I'm going to close with this. 1 Corinthians 14, here's the way to know. When God speaks to you, you will have peace and not confusion. That's the bottom line. If anything comes to you, a verse, a person gives you a scripture, somebody says something, you hear a voice, and you lose your peace, put it on the back burner. Because God's a God of peace, not of confusion. I remember there was a woman here years ago that came to me and said, Pastor, you are not called to travel. You are not called to the nations. And we as a board think you need to be in your home church and stop taking Sunday morning speaking engagements. Threw me into mass confusion because I kind of knew my calling back in that day to travel and speak. But I was pastoring here with my husband. And this woman's word, and she said it in front of the whole board, the woman's word just tilted me. I thought, I can't be two places at one time. God, you've called me to preach and teach and travel. How can I be in our own pulpit every single Sunday? And I lost my peace for a long time. I was conflicted and confused and did not know what to do. Then I went back to God and I said, what are you saying to me? Because you're not going to tell me one thing and then tell me something else. And I realized, and this is not to be hard on her, but I realized that she wanted me here. She liked my style of teaching, and she didn't want me out evangelizing when we had a church to pastor. That was her spirit, not God's spirit. So if you lose your peace and you're thrown into confusion, I'm going to be bold enough to say to you this morning, it's probably not the spirit of God, and I hope that helps you. So I want to read 1 Corinthians 14, 29. It says, let the prophets speak one, two, or three, and let the others judge. If anything's revealed to another, let the first hold his peace. You can all prophesy one by one that you can learn and be comforted. For the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the saints. So when you get a word from the Lord, whether it's a written scripture, whether it's a spoken word, whether it's the spirit of God nudging you, If you have no peace, may I say to you, move very slowly. Because you'll have peace when God speaks, even if it's not something you're thrilled to do. I'm trying to get done. So I'll make this as fast as I can. My husband was a giver. He would give and give and give. He just loved giving. And one day I came home from a meeting. I was speaking in, in Vineland. And I came home from a meeting and he was washing the truck. And he said, I heard from God today. And I said, how much is this going to cost me? I'm sorry. That's exactly what I said to him. What's this going to cost me? And he said, well, he said, I told God, you know my wife. And we're one. So if you're telling me to do this, you have to tell my wife. So he said, God, now listen to this. And don't do this. It's immature. It's childish. I'm not recommending it. But we were immature and childish. So, and my husband knew me well enough to know there was no way I was going to do this if I didn't hear from God. So he says to me, I want you to pray. Ask the Lord for the amount of money. And ask the Lord for the name of the ministry. Well, a a number dropped into my head with way too many zeros. I'm like, no, 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 no. Then the name of a ministry. And I thought, no way. 
So my husband waits a day, and he says, well, did you hear anything from God? I said, maybe. He said, what do you think we should give? I said, oh, 500. He said, you didn't hear from God. And he said, you're lying to me. I said, yes, I am. I am lying to you. And uh, so on the third day, he said, this is what we're going to do. And remember, I don't recommend this. He took four pieces of paper and two little golf pencils, gave me a pencil with two pieces of paper, had his little pencil with two pieces of paper. And he says, now on one piece of paper, you write the name of the church or the ministry we're going to give it to, fold it up, put it in the table. The second piece of paper, you write the amount of money you think God may be saying for us to give to this church ministry. So I write the money. I, I didn't want to do it. We put the four papers in the middle of the table, and he says to me, if they're not exact match, then I didn't hear from God. And how many of you know, it was an absolute exact match, the name of the ministry in California, the amount of money. And so I, please don't be this immature and childish. But I, there was no way I would have given that money away if I didn't hear, and God had to confirm it because it was big bucks. Are you with me? I said, cha-ching, cha-ching. I said big bucks. <laughs> I just want to make sure you're paying attention. And God's met every need because we've been faithful. So would you stand while we pray? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much that you still speak to us. I think of all these false religions that spend hours on their knees and beat themselves with rods and light candles and say seances and all this trying to hear something. And all we have to do is say like Samuel, speak Lord, your servant heareth. I pray for every person online watching this and those in our congregation that God will spend time in the word and that your word will speak to us. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And Lord, we thank you that we don't have to look for the wind and the fire and the earthquake. All we have to do is listen for the sweet whisper of the voice of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that your spirit will nudge us and guide us and even there might be times that will warn us, and we just thank you for that. And we pray that we'd have an obedient spirit. And, Lord, I pray for the peace of God that passes understanding that whenever we hear a word, if we are in confusion, then, Lord, your word said that's not from God because you're a God of peace, as in all the saints of the churches. So thank you for the peace of God this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You're dismissed. If you need personal prayer, I'll be available.